So welcome to our afternoon programming. Um, the next panel is called Data Without Borders, and this is a fascinating topic for us that we've covered um, for the past few years, um, the general concept being, is there a need for a global re registry of all sound recordings and compositions? How could that uh, facilitate both the licensing side of the, con of the process of um, services that need music, and also how can it facilitate the payments going back to artists and right holder, right hold, rights holders. So it's a fascinating conversation that involves a number of, of um, stakeholders, and we're so pleased to welcome our guests here today for a conversation about Data Without Borders. Thank you, Kristen. We should applaud you for showing up. And um, I want to thank the staff for all the hard work they put in, not just in this panel, but all the panels we've had. And um, Hank Williams Jr. will not be joining us today. Um, I just want to say one thing before we start, which was for those of you who were here a year ago, um, Charlie Angus and I did a presentation about the Apple Water Scat. A reservation in Northern Ontario in Shannon's Dream. And as we're speaking right now, Charlie can't be with us. He's in the Canadian Parliament talking about Future Music Coalition and reintroducing the Shannon's Dream Bill, which we gave the presentation about last week, which will, uh, it's an attempt to fully fund the schools for the children of the Cree tribe and the other native tribes who live in, in uh, Northern Ontario, in Saskatchewan, in Nunavut, in Quebec, uh, the Northwest Territories. And so, I, I find it highly gratifying that, you know, while we're doing this, there's people speaking about us in the Canadian Parliament in Ottawa right now and talking about how, you know, our organization helped to uh, serve as a platform for a very important social issue uh, that I believe very strongly in is because I think every kid should get, a, should get an education. And a lot of the kids, I guess, back in Apple Water Scap and, and some of the other uh, reservations are actually watching us. So if you guys are out there and want to say hi, I know there's few watching with us, so thank you. So we're, you're with us in spirit. Um, I don't know where to begin with this panel. This is very complicated stuff, um, but it's very important. And although this may be the calculus, uh, if some of the other panels were risk the tick in geometry, this is in, in, in no less important. And as a result, we've uh, attempted, given the significance of this issue, to really have a panel with experts, uh, not only from uh, North America, but throughout the world, the men who have been working uh, extremely conscientiously over the past decade or so to really bring this to, uh, not a fruition per se, but to really uh, inform the public and to really work cooperatively in order to try to make the dream of uh, global registry, uh, global music registry a reality. So I'd like to start with uh, an old friend of the FMC, an old friend of mine, I'd like to have uh, Jim Griffin briefly outlined the problem. Uh, sure, and, and I thank you for that, Walter. <clears throat> uh, I will say that fundamentally the problem is that we need to make it faster, easier, and simpler to pay for music. And I think secondarily, uh, the notion is, is that the world is changing dramatically from products to services. You know, I've called it Tarzan economics in the past, and you know, it's true that if your need is to release a music product, it's, uh, it's relatively simple. You either clear it or you don't release it on iTunes or in a disc form or whatever if you are dealing with a music product. But in the new world of music services, we are not so privileged to know what music is being used. And so it is that, say, Sound Exchange that uh, Jonathan is from, the webcaster can choose any music that they wish to play. And uh, then by paying the money to Sound Exchange, Sound Exchange is left having to find who to give that money to. And it is fair to say, I think, that we are moving from a world of product to service. The money is up a great deal. I think it is probably conservative to say that Sound Exchange's money has grown 50% a year. That's five zero percent a year. And so services growing as they are, it presents a real challenge about getting that money to those who deserve it. And to add to this backdrop, of course, as you know, under the Berne Convention, uh, it is not required that one register music in order to have a copyright in that music. And so 
uh, there are any of a number of issues here that, uh, that raise a need that we enumerate our rights if we wish to have them respected as those who own music or create music. Uh, and so it is that this challenge has presented itself very, very clearly. Now, to my left, Mark Isherwood, uh, this guy has dedicated his life to this. Before I knew this was a problem, he knew it was going to be a problem. And he's built a company around it, Rightscom. And where he's from, the problems are even worse. And I say that not because of anything he's done. It's what he's saddled with. Europe is so many different jurisdictions that the only thing that one could compare in the United States is if copyright were truly a state's issue and you had to go to all 50 states in order to license. And then you add in that the publishers, uh, say with an urban track, could have as many as 30 songwriters. And if they were all divorced once, that's 60 rights holders. So uh, I guess you could compare it to Lily Tomlin at her worst switchboard, trying to figure out every country and every rights holder and to bring them together in a way that produces uh, a relatively easy way to license and pay for music. So that's my summation, and I think it outlines the need, but I'm sure the other panelists have something that they would like to add about this. So, Mark, what is the solution? Well, there, there is no single solution. There's not one end-to-end -end thing you can put in place that will provide um, the technology infrastructure we need to manage not just digital music, but all digital media in, in the online world. Um, and it's because we're moving from um, a high-value, low-volume environment to the complete opposite. Um, people talk about, you know, for example, in Europe, Spotify one month returns six gigabyte files of usage as a bare minimum. Um, so the problem we've got is that the infrastructure has simply not been in place um, in the physical analog world that we now need. And there are several elements to this. One is the ability to send information between business partners in a standard way. Another one is to be able to identify individual works or sound recordings, who owns them and who you have to pay. And there, and there are lots of others. Um, and I'm sitting here with at least two hats on today um, because uh, two of the organizations that I work with are doing bits and pieces of, of this uh, infrastructure. One is a, a standards organization called DDEX, which stands for Digital Data Exchange. Um, it was set up by a, a consortium of the labels, some of the early retailers and the music rights societies to develop standard XML message formats so that everybody is using the same format rather than having to deal with 50 to 100 different proprietary ones. So it cuts down cost, it improves the efficiency and actually helps drive more revenue. Um, so that's one uh, hat. The other hat is um, I'm the non-voting chair of something called the Global Repertoire Database Working Group, nice snappy title. Um, and what that is seeking to do is to develop a single database of all musical works with their ownership information and the splits in the case of the publishing and to maintain that on an ongoing basis. And the reason that that is needed is the way in which uh, copyright musical works are licensed now is completely different from the way they were licensed, you know, as late as, 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 as 2000 or somewhere around there. If you were a, a broadcaster in the UK and you needed a license for musical works, you went to PRS and they gave you a license for the UK for the worldwide repertoire. You can't do that anymore, um, partly because the BBC, for example, has got services all over the world, literally, and is looking for a license, a multi-territorial license. And the societies don't have that information. They have the ownership information for their own territory, but they don't have um, the information for other territories. And what the Global Repertoire Database is intended to do is to provide an authoritative source of that information that everybody, everybody can rely on to use as the, as the core to then run transaction processing against it. Um, and uh, so those are just two of the building blocks that are needed. There are several others um, that, as a metadata nerd, I can bore you um, about for hours and hours if, if, if my voice holds out that long. 
Um, but those are two of the, the building blocks that are going to meet the sort of um, nightmare scenario that Jim's talking about. So, Jonathan, how does uh, sound exchange fit into this equation? Okay, well, yeah, we actually pay people. And we depend on metadata to pay people. Uh, so, as you may know, Sound Exchange is a performing rights organization that pays performers and labels or, or the rights holders uh, for digital performances, uh, which is primarily webcasting and satellite radio and business establishments and the like. Uh, we have a near and present need for a repertoire database. Uh, the way Sound Exchange has only been around for about 10 years. And the way it was originally set up is that services would send a log of what they played in the last month to Sound Exchange, and they would say, okay, I, you know, kind of copied the data off of the CD that I, you know, bought at Tower Records, and I wrote down the artist name and typed in the track name, and there's a bunch of logos on the back. Uh, I recognize Warner Brothers. I'll type in Warner Brothers as the owner. And then they submit that data to Sound Exchange. Uh, and then we get these logs. The service makes a payment based on a statutory rate set by the Copyright Board. And we distribute the money to the artist and to the, to the label. Uh, as you can imagine, the data is, you know, is not great. Uh, there's, we, we don't have a particular hammer to use to ensure that the data is good. Uh, so we're, we're dependent on this, this data that comes in that's not very good. I think when Sound Exchange was originally formed, there was anticipation that there would be a repertoire database. And, and as Mark and Jim know, over the years, uh, there have been various efforts at creating some sort of a uh, you know, global repository of repertoire metadata. But suffice it to say, it's never happened. Uh, so Sound Exchange finds itself in this this position of cleaning data all the time, and and trust me, I would I would rather do anything than clean metadata all day long. And we have you know lots of college students who we we enlist to help us clean metadata. So we we have a near and present need, and we are actively participating with DDEX and Mark and the other uh, the other efforts around the world. To, uh, to establish such a repertoire database. And it will, it will have you know, a, an immediate and noticeable impact on the accurate and timely payment of performers and labels. Yeah, in, 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 in purposes of disclosure, I'm a, one of the board of directors of Sound Exchange too, so we're not trying to hide anything. Although I, I am trying to hide that I'm a Red Sox fan, but that's a different story. <laughs> but, but, but I mean, just in, in, in layperson's terms, I mean, without a data cleansing um, effort, there's going to be distortion in payment of royalties. And, right. and, and some person could get overpaid, another person could get underpaid, and anecdotally you'll hear the experience of Band X who I've actually had this conversation with briefly with someone here. I mean, it, it looks like it's off. And it's not a deliberate intent to underpay somebody, it's just that for some reason the data hasn't been cleansed, per, hasn't been cleansed properly, there hasn't been proper uh, reporting on, by, on behalf of the webcasters in, in order to um, you know, if you don't get the correct data matched up, you're going to have some sort of serious statistical distortions of the payment of royalties. That's just absolutely right. Yeah. Just, just a brief observation for a second, and that is that it, Sound Exchange needs to pay people it's never met, whereas ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC need only pay their members. Right. And so th that's, that's right. a worthwhile observation is that we've saddled them statutorily with a burden that is dramatically different than that, than that that is imposed on most performing rights organizations around the world. Right, and, and so we have a huge outreach organization where we try to reach performers, we try to reach labels, we try to verify ownership and, and who controls the rights. Uh, but as you can imagine, we are receiving millions of lines of data a month, and it's, it's quite a task. Uh, so for us, the idea of having a repertoire database uh, where you know, we can match uh, the reports that come into us to a known source of record. So the owners of the repertoire have submitted this data, it's accurate, we can pay people according to that, uh, will be a great boon for Sound Exchange. Well, we're particularly happy to have Eric with us, not just because we like him, but also because he's you know, uniquely articulate in this field, and I thought the best way of uh, 
sort of introducing you to folks who may not be familiar with your background is um, just sort of describe what you've done professionally in the past and how it kind of fits into this debate. Well, I shouldn't say debate, it's conversation, okay? We're not arguing with each other. Yeah, although I'm originally a broadcaster, um, I, uh, I ran CISAC with the C, the World Federation, CISAC, of societies around the world for 12 years, uh, from 98 to uh, last year. Um, and uh, CISAC with the C unites 230 uh, societies around the world, and it's true that PROs, for example, have to pay their own members, but their biggest challenge is to uh, identify the, the works uh, of other PROs because they all, they all represent each other and I'm now the CEO of SOCAN in Canada. Uh, I represent about more than 100,000 Canadian members of SOCAN but through agreements with about 120 societies around the world, uh, we represent more than 3 million entities, publishers, uh, foreign writers in the US, in Germany, in Australia, in Japan, in South Africa, etc., etc. So. The first thing I wanted to say uh, this afternoon is that the challenges are, are bigger today, but they're not new. And uh, we've not been asleep at the wheel, contrary to what people might think. I mean, we societies. Um, for, 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 for more than 15 years now, close to 20, uh, societies have been developing a, a system of uh, standard numbers with associated metadata uh, to uh, uniquely identify all the relevant pieces of information. Not because of the internet, although the internet was looming at the time, 1994, 90, uh, but to facilitate this exchange of data. Because if, you, if I send uh, money to, uh, even in an easy country like Australia, speaking English, if I send money just to my colleagues in Australia from Canada and I, and I can't tell them to whom the money should be distributed in a, in a, in a manageable way, they will either make mistakes or not be able to distribute it or distribute it at very high costs. So uh, CISAC and, it, and, the, and their members um, developed a number for identifying each musical work. And the musical work is not the recording, it's the, it's the composition, it's the melody, it's the, 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 um, the words. Um, so that this is called ISWC, International Standard Work Code, and I believe there are more than 21 million that have been issued, and they are fairly reliable. Uh, there's been an effort in recent years to clean up the, uh, the ISWC database, and it, it is a fairly reliable uh, identifier. Even before that, um, societies have um, put together a database uniquely identifying each author, composer, and publisher. It's about 2.5, 3 million entries in the database that is called IPI. So if uh, um, money has to be sent to someone, we know, we know through the number which one it is. So we don't send uh, money that, uh, go, that should go to the John Williams who wrote the famous scores to other John Williamses, and there are about 20 in the database. And you can imagine that we would have very happy uh, people for a while, but a very unhappy uh, for prominent member of, uh, of our network, and we would have to adjust num the, the, the payments very, very quickly. Uh, we also uh, developed um, a standard for identification of audiovisual uh, works it's called ISAN together with the film industry. Uh, I won't go into the details, but the main challenge we have today is the, the metadata indeed. Uh, the fact that uh, the reports that we get from the users of works, even traditional users like broadcasters, are, are mainly uh, based on recordings, and it's hard very often to match the recording to the, to the actual work, or it's, it's even, even more difficult to match uh, a, a song or a musical score that has been used uh, in an audiovisual production like a film or, or, or an episode of a TV series. That's where the high costs are, and whatever can be put together to uh, reduce the uh, um, human intervention in dealing with this identification will greatly enhance the, the work of societies, even in the offline world. Um, the main thing is to, be, to build upon those standards. Um, the big question uh, on, on, the, on the panel today is, do we need a, a central database or something? The answer is probably yes, but it can only be built and populated accurately if we all rely on standards, if we all agree to have a clean, um, database identifying musical works. If we all agree to have a clean database identifying 
sound recordings, and that is still a challenge. More than musical works, recordings require more work, maybe not in the US, but around the world. Uh, we need a way to standardize the reporting of, uh, of the use of audiovisual works to us and sound exchange and other organizations around the world because this is the highest cost center in my organization, uh, trying to identify what works have been used in, the, in an episode of any of the series, including the most popular ones. Um, and if we're able to do this, we can really uh, simplify the, um, uh, the, uh, the payments to, 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 our, to our members. The, uh, one of the obstacles we, we, we need to, uh, to, to overcome, besides the standardization, is the um, um, kind of uh, agreement by everyone that this is important. Metadata is not just for technologists and, uh, and, and specialists and IT people. We need to convince the heads of the studios, we need to convince the heads of the record companies that they have to allocate sufficient resources for metadata to be, to be allocated as quickly as possible, that they can flow down uh, through all the, all the streams, uh, because when, when, the, when, the, when the work is out there, it's, it's much more difficult to, to, to back, um, identify the, the, the thing. And finally, in my initial remarks, we need to separate those issues uh, with the uh, kind of um, strategic and political issues. Uh, there, is, there is a fear factor uh, clouding this issue. Um, people are afraid that by um, kind of committing to the use of, uh, of uh, more efficient identifiers and more efficient metadata uh, protocols, they might lose their relevance. Uh, they, might, they might not be uh, uh, needed anymore. And uh, nothing could be further than the, from the truth, but still there is, this, there is this perception factor out there. And I think it's important that no one makes statements that, gives, that could give the impression that by, that by ma being more efficient, you might, you might put yourself out of business. This is one of the main things holding back progress on, on the metadata issue and the, and the global repertoire database at, at this moment. You know, it's interesting that, um, you know, among the many things that makes this a complicated process, which I'm sure um, most people realize, but I think it's important to say, is the fact that, you know, we're dealing with two different types of copyrights here. We're dealing with the sound recording copyrights and the musical work copyrights, and that's pretty much, we have an example here where Eric works with musical works and Jonathan works with sound recording. So that, that's also part of the complexity, the fact that we have two different copyrights we have to work with. But Fred, did they properly identify you? If so, yes. Good. I so I just wanted to let you, why don't sure. you explain to people what you do, and I wanted to hear what your perspective sure. on this issue was. So my name is Fred Bate. I'm the Senior Vice President of Operations and Technology at RightsFlow. Uh, RightsFlow is a royalty service provider based in New York. Clients are record labels, music services, and essentially we identify content, get licenses and report on their behalf to publishers, societies, etc. cetera. Um, prior to that, I spent seven years at Harry, the Harry Fox Agency helping build their technologies and their tra transactional data platform. So I get this issue, <laughs> and it, you know, it's wildly complex. I've worked with Mark on, on a lot of DDEX initiatives and been to the plenaries and such. And you know, from my perspective, I, I, have, I have two questions, I guess, for the group and two points. So we've seen the, the music business explode digitally, right? And, and the free market companies like Apple, et cetera, put a lot of technology and effort towards uh, you know, promoting the way that music gets to consumers. And all this back-end stuff is sort of catching up. It's, it's the tail of the evolution of the business. So I guess the question is, do, to the group, is do we feel that the GRD, IMR type solutions and their challenges, political and otherwise, uh, strategic stuff that Eric you know, mentioned just a minute ago, do we feel that we're at risk for letting the free market dictate a solution you know, before everyone kind of catches up to what the free market's already done in pushing music to consumers. It's possible that that solution comes to the free market and it comes quicker. So I think that's one of the challenges that the GRD and the IMR groups have, is that potentially bigger players that have come into the music industry previously will come in again and solve this problem for us. And I'm wondering if that's a good or a bad thing. Well, I, I mean, my, my view of this is very it is in the interest so it is in the industry's own interest to solve its own problems i agree with you that there are companies out there that probably could come and do this um, you know in a very short space of time but at the end of the day they could, all they could do was to build the infrastructure they wouldn't be able to get the hands on the data 
and you can't just make that up. And the only way that data is going to be made available is if um, the environment in which people are being asked to put it gives everybody some skin in the game and, makes, and allows people to feel that they have a voice about the way in which something like GRD is run and operated and, uh, and be very much part of that. Um, so where the GRD work at the moment is we've just kicked off a 20-week uh, stakeholder engagement and scoping study, and by far the biggest stream of work in that is stakeholder engagement. You know, you put some clever technical guys in a room, they'll solve this problem in a fairly short period of time. The real issue, and, and um, Eric touched on it earlier, is hearts and minds. It's getting people to feel comfortable that this is going to work for them, um, and getting them involved, getting them to believe that these are the right, the right solutions. Um, I think, you know, Eric is right that on the Musical Work Society level, they've put a lot of work in this over a, a long period of time, but most of that has been within the silo of the publisher and Music Rights Society community. What we have in digital now is a need for everybody in the supply chain to be involved in these discussions because these little pieces of data that one uh, sector of the industry creates are now business critical to everybody up and down the supply chain. So you can't standardize within your own little world. Um, and so, obviously, both GRD and DDEX recognize that. They've got much wider stakeholder uh, representation um, for that very reason. And I think that's what is different from what's gone before. Um, you've got to have everybody involved, and you've got to get the data out there. And the truth is that the volume of transactions is also an issue that's different from the past. You know, if you look at any big industry that's gone from this kind of low to very high volume transaction, they've had to agree amongst themselves how to standardize everything and run it as a completely automated service. Banking, insurance, travel agents, airline ticketing, all of those have moved towards completely automated environments because if they didn't, um, it, your, your airline tickets would cost four times as much because they'd have to employ 400 people to actually do it by hand. Um, so, you know, this is why this is important to all of you, even though it may sound a bit nerdy and a bit technical. Um, in the end, it's about you being involved and recognizing that this is important so that your money flows correctly and transparently back to you in this new, this new world. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are unique challenges to, to this, and uh, having a big technology solution is not enough. Um, because uh, you can't you can't substitute one song for another. It's not like one dollar. One dollar equals one dollar. Uh, one song is a is different thing, and you you need to be able to to get people to agree on ways to resolve conflicts and decide which is the authoritative piece of information. If you have 23 conflicting informations around the world. And in order to do so, uh, they need to agree on business rules. They need to agree on on um, on um, uh, who's going to benefit from 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 this and that. And um, I, I I remember myself and at uh, at Medem in 2001 was it um, Mark when we announced the launch of then MI3P that became DDEX. It takes a lot of time, and um, I'm always worried when I, when, I, when I see people coming up with an idea that they think is a magic wand. You build this tool, uh, and, uh, and it will solve all the problems. The horrible truth is that, the, um, that music is so popular and so diverse around the world that uh, it's, it's, it's a horrendous task to try to put order uh, into that chaos. Um, it's, uh, all, there's also a lot of legacy uh, issues that have been accumulating around the world, and you have to uh, reconcile uh, more than 100 databases uh, around the world, uh, and people have reasons to believe over time that their information is accurate, so you need to agree on principles. It's like a world peace, some, something's got to give. And you need to have business, princip business principles and business rules rather than technology solutions. So yes, somebody can come up with big money, and uh, a lot of uh, IT firepower, but they will just organize a bit better what we have already organized not so badly. In, in my company, we identify most of the uses uh, automatically without human intervention. Um, yeah, even for, for new things, when we first licensed uh, SiriusXM, 
which kind of typically broadcasts more music than a uh, typical radio station, 70% was automatically identified and uh, only 30% had to be manually identified. So somebody could bring this to uh, 80% with better computers, better algorithms, but the, the, co the, the costly part is the 30%, it's not the 70%. So that's, that's, we need to be realistic and work together. And most of us are in agreement about this, but we have to also to make sure that we don't use technology as a pretext to, to kind of uh, uh, force uh, business changes that the market would not require anyway. I want to address this from the standpoint of the United Nations uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, which I work for, on this particular project, the International Music Registry. And the key thing to understand is that from the beginning, it, it doesn't intend to replace any registries. It intends to synchronize the registries that exist. So if the free market produces registries, they're certainly welcome to both benefit from and contribute to any kind of registry that uh, is put together. And frankly, uh, WIPO's done it with patents and with trademarks. They've got a world patent registry, a world trademark registry. And to your question of whether the free market can solve the problem, and of course it can solve pieces of it, obviously. The free market has registries, as I'm sure you do. And, uh, but is this, is that we need to see registries <clears throat> the way we see lighthouses. And that is that lighthouses had a history of not getting built by private businesses, even though they were necessary to commerce. Government's role, we can all question it, but I think no matter whether you are conservative or a liberal, you will agree that lighthouses are the province of government, that these, some of these things are needed in order to get things to flow. And in the United States, we need look no further than our problem with recording mortgages. The free market took it upon itself to create a separate mortgage registration system called MERS, M-E-R-S, that is now held responsible for a great deal of the crisis surrounding property and mortgages and foreclosures and so forth. And so MERS is not <clears throat> a good example of private enterprise solving a problem. But on the other hand, recorders of deeds around the world, uh, the WIPO's patent and trademark registries, frankly, writing was invented, clay tablets and reeds by the Sumerians with the intent of recording property. So fundamental is the recording of property to our culture. So this is an essential thing that must be done. And I will agree with you, though, that this probably should be done as an outsource. In other words, it's not like it needs to be the post office to get it done. And WIPO, in fact, does intend to outsource this in a public-private partnership. So I think all in all, you would be satisfied with the idea that this is not one registry. It is a quilt of many registries that need to be synchronized together in much the same way that patents and trademarks and mortgages are handled. And that when it is, it will be a lighthouse for commerce, making it faster, easier, and simpler to pay and hopefully leading to a sustainable economy of ideas, something that is escaping us so far in our private efforts. But you know, the, part of the problem, though, is that <clears throat> you know, patents and trademarks are easier to administer than a copyright. Different, that's yeah. right. Yeah, and, and you know, for, for those, we don't want to use very, too It's very different in a fundamental way, right. because you only file a patent when you think you, you have a um, um, good prospect of a benefiting from it, exploiting it, because it costs you to register a patent. So it's, it's, it's a business decision. With music, you compose a song, you write lyrics, and you file it with uh, your, your society, your publisher, and many of those things will never see any commercial exploitation or, or, or any meaningful commercial exploitation. So the, all the, 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 the dynamics about, about, about patents and, 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 and music copyrights are very different. And uh, the way, the way those are managed, the uh, fundamental reasons why people, or people file a patent or, 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 or register a work, the, 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 the financial dy dynamics inside the, the, uh, the silos, uh, the patent silos and the music silos are very different. So it's, it's a comparison that is valid, but up to a point only. All right, and, um, and just not to use too much jargon, but the musical work is the song, and the, the sound recording obviously is the recorder performance of the song. But I mean, part of the administration problem goes to, I mean, if you look at The Chronic, for example, by Dr. Dre, I mean, there's a lot of songwriters in that, but I'm not worried about Dr. Dre getting uh, paid because I'm sure that the folks at, at Interscope have, over the years, have embedded data and his publishers have embedded data, but when Eric talks about the 30%, if you have a young group of guys from, I don't know, Washington, D.C., who make a hip-hop record with multiple writers and multiple performers, 
and it's a DIY record, and they may do very well because it's a great record, they may fall into the 30% because it's hard to get all that information. I mean, I'm not concerned about the majors doing it. They do a fairly decent job, but the DIY people, the people nine times out of 10 will fall into the 20 or 30%. It's very easy if it's done well. If, right. if, if the information, if, if, if this new group, uh, when, they, when, they're, when they record this, uh, their song, their, their CD or whatever it is, if, if, if everything is well documented initially, then it's a real piece of cake. I'm not kidding. It's very easy. We know it. We know who they are. They're usually a member of uh, of one of our societies. It might be SoCan for if there are 20 uh, out of Toronto, 15 might be uh, SoCan members. Five might be from USPRO. We, it's it's very easy to track the use of the of, of the music if we if the metadata is, is 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 well documented initially and if the users of the of the of the work so the recordings doesn't really matter at this stage. Um, report accurately using international standards or industry standards. A after that, it's just adding up numbers and 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 and, uh, and sending the money to the to the right people. So the sooner it is it is it is uh, embedded or or well recorded, the the, the easiest it will be to um, to to find the right people to send them the right amount of money. But because to a certain degree. There's a burden on the DIY artists and the indie labels to actually catch up in the space too. So there is a small part of a duty the on their part. The key yeah. word that Eric used there is initially. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when the music industry was making shitloads of money, this sort of thing didn't really matter too much because the money still came in and more or less got paid to the right people. Now you're struggling for every kind of one percent of the dime, um, all of the all of the time. The industry has got to learn to be thoroughly robust about its metadata. It hasn't had to be up until now, but my God, it has to be from now on. And you know that's what's critical about this and why it's important. Um, I mean, Eric is right that by and large, in most most cases, if the data is captured at, at the beginning of the process, the system will do it thereafter. But the problem is that the data isn't getting captured. Um, uh, at the beginning um, because uh, people aren't aware of the importance of it. Uh, a colleague of mine coined the phrase around all of this is do it once and do it right. And that's what this industry's got to move towards and be robust and disciplined to the nth degree about making sure it met its metadata is of the very highest caliber. Now I'll agree with that, but I have to say that there's two additional challenges that make this still more important and difficult and important for the United Nations to help with. Because I agree with, with what you said, Mark, but I would say that not all the answers are found from looking in the mirror at our own behavior. First of all, the BRICS countries and the idea of the internationalization of, the music, of music is an absolutely critical understanding. We are reliably informed by economists that over the next several decades, the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, will rise to economic importance that is as great or greater than that of the G7. And today those countries contribute to our copyright economy less than the copyright economy of Spain. And it is essential that we build infrastructure in those countries, even outside of, say, synchronizing the data, that within Brazil, within Russia, within India, within China, within South Africa, and outside of them, that we build registries and accommodate, create a copyright infrastructure that can accommodate the future such that they can both contribute to and receive from an international economy in music. And secondly, we have new problems within our borders. And I will not call it so much a problem as it is an awakening. And that is that creativity is moving from the center of the network to its edge. And that is a critical thing that is important and good, but is a challenge for us. And so yes, <clears throat> we have a problem making sure that the song Blowing in the Wind that Bob Dylan wrote and performs is properly registered and paid, but there's probably also 7,500 plus versions that are on YouTube now with, say, Michael Stipe and Patti Smith doing a duet. Each one of them different works, and then exponentially still more as we move into a future where every concert is recorded by a thousand different people in right. the seats and uploaded somewhere to a network. Right. And while this is precisely the kind of anarchy that is wonderful for music. Our task, especially Eric's at CISAC and many of the PRO people here, is to monetize the wonderful anarchy of music. 
It is part of what makes this art form so exciting. And yet, it is also one of the greatest challenges as we try to enumerate our rights and ensure that, it, that there is payment. And it will only become more difficult as, as commerce spreads to other countries and we see commerce move from those who are at the center, hovered around a radio transmitter or a cable head end or a network head end, out to the edge of the network using the new tools that have been provided to create derivative works, record existing works, remix works, and bring us a broad array of culture the likes of which we have not seen in the past hundred years. Well, webcasting certainly makes that all possible, and it is one of the great frontiers where anybody can be a webcaster. And it does also, it is part of the transition in the industry where performers increasingly control their own masters. I mean, I think I don't have to tell everybody here that the, the influence of the major labels has lessened somewhat with the decline of the CD. And the performer and independent labels are you know, increasing in importance. And the revenue stream from webcasting and from satellite is only going to grow. So I think it's incumbent upon performers and these independent labels to be more aware of these revenue streams. I mean, it, it's, I'm, I'm relatively new to sound exchange and was, was stunned to learn that we have thousands upon thousands of artists and independent labels as well who have have not registered with Sound Exchange, and we can't pay you unless you register. And we've contacted people numerous times and say, we have money for you, uh, but we can't get people to register. So uh, I think there's a you know, growing awareness of these alternate revenue streams, and, and I think the Future of Music Coalition is, uh, is playing a great part in, in publicizing these alternate streams. But Sound Exchange is really one of them, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, a part of the, you know, the industry's moving that direction, and, but people are going to have to take more responsibility for, uh, you know, for securing their income streams. And that dovetails nicely to uh, Gene and Kristen's work on the Addis Revenue <coughs> study. Exactly. Very good. Um, Can I ask the controversial sure. question? Of, uh, just to raise it, because it, it's getting talked about. I mean, Carrie Sherman recently testified before the National Academy of Sciences that perhaps we should revisit the question of whether registration is required. And, and by the way, when asked, he said, well, you know, we can't find all of the people who created the artwork, and so it's very difficult to exploit a, a musical work when you can't find those who made the album cover and clear that. Uh, you know, you've got a, he's got a compulsory over the publishing, but not a compulsory over the artwork person. And, and we're in such an interdependent world now and it is a different world than that which brought us the Berne Convention, which said that you don't have to register in order to get a copyright. And I'm not so much suggesting, by the way, that you must register in order to get a copyright, but I think it's blunt and clear to say that if you are not registered, you're not going to get paid, right? I mean, that's just a modern reality. And so, you know, given that we live in a world now of cell phones and intercommunication and registry surely can't be considered so difficult, you know, I was reading an article in the Washington Post just recently that said that tuna fishermen off the coast of third world countries are registering the capture of fish so that they can optimize the money they get and figure out which port to bring it back to. And surely if someone catching a fish can register the capture of a fish, a songwriter or a song uh, recording can be registered somewhere around the time that it was made such that the rest of us can be on notice that they claim a right to it and that they wish to be paid or they wish there to be a license. So it may be controversial to suggest it, but perhaps it's time to discuss whether registration isn't a modern reality, both in terms of ease of use and necessity in an interdependent world where entrepreneurs need rights to, uh, in order to uh, respect the law and we need to get paid in order to pay our bills, Maybe we should revisit registration. Jim, I'm, well, not, I'm not sure about this because, uh, what they, as, as Mark said initially, the, the problem we have at the moment is that the, um, the music industry, the dig digital uses are, generated very, are generating very few revenues compared to the costs that are um, necessary to manage the, 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 to process the, 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 those revenues. So we should think twice before adding another layer of cost because if, if, if anyone runs a, a kind of compulsory uh, uh, registration system, it, it will be governmental or quasi-governmental. It's, 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 it's going to be adding costs. The, 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 the strange thing is that uh, for 
my part of the world, the music copy or the, the, the um, musical works, the publishers, the songwriters, uh, we don't have this problem that uh, we don't know to whom the money should be sent. They 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 come to us. They register their songs. They as soon as anyone becomes uh, fairly active in the, even playing a little bit in the in the neighborhood bars, they register their their their, their works with with one society or the other. So I think it's. Uh, it's a problem that is significant for the so-called neighboring rights, the rights of record companies and, and, uh, and performers, artists, and it requires education, it requires information before going to the, to the, to the step of kind of compulsory registration. I, I, would, I would first try to see how um, we could together uh, inform those guys better that, that they, have, they have money waiting for them. In the past, it, it used to be not that important. They got so much money if they were successful through the uh, recording deals and, uh, and all those things that they, could, that they didn't have to bother about uh, the collective management of their rights through entities like Sound Exchange. Now Sound Exchange is, is getting very important, and for some reason, this does not register with some people. No pun intended. Um. I, mean, I, and, I don't <laughs> think we're suggesting compulsory. No, no. no, I mean... We're, I Jim was, I Jim was I, overing over a I don't agree with, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't agree with what Jim no, saying. I just but raised I'm, the topic. I, no, no, I don't no. want to be seen as an advocate of compulsory registration. I'm simply suggesting we have an intelligent discussion yes. about we how can, we approach the issue. And we, so can, we can have it. Your, we can have it. Views. And we I'm not saying it. we need to do it, but I'm saying we could talk about how we get more things registered. And one of them might be you don't get paid if you're not registered. I mean, that's the rule in London, I'm told. And, uh, well, you don't get paid if I don't know where to send the check. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. That's it. Why don't we make I mean, the revenues that, that are unclaimed more transparent? Right. Put, it, put it out there and let people say, that's mine. Right. But unlike Eric, I mean, we're in a country with $150,000 statutory damages for each copy of a song, not title of a song. So it might be a little bit different in a place where the stick is so painful that perhaps the obligation to at least inform others of those rights that you can so readily uh, exercise, but it's just the discussion, Mark. I'm not saying it's, I'm not proposing it. No, my, my, my concern was more about what Eric said about, you know, uh, a Canadian writer in a Canadian bar registering with SOCAN and they'll get their money. That's fine, and that worked brilliantly in a world where the use of music was largely contained by countries' borders. If I'm in Germany and want to play that guy's music and get a license to do it, I don't know how to get the information about who he is, where he is, and who is going to issue me the license. And it's the globalization that the internet has caused and the complete breakdown of territorial licensing, which copyright has worked brilliantly well on for 100 to 150 years, which is causing this problem. So, you know, there are problems that are new now. Um, and whilst good things have been done in the context of a territorial copyright licensing regime, that's been blown away, and we've got to put a bunch of new tr um, uh, infrastructure in place in order to manage it properly. So the only thing I'd say, Jim, is that... <coughs> that's right, Mark, but it, it still works in, the, in, the, in most of the cases. Uh, it's, it's the internet that, that is changing the, the situation. If that, if that Canadian band plays in the, plays in the, ba in the bar, or if, if the music is played on the radio station in Germany, we can deal with that. We've been dealing with that for, for decades very efficiently. The problem is multi-territorial uses, the, um, the fact that, uh, th that that requires a new layer of, uh, of information. So we should not give the impression to anyone that the system is completely broken. No, no, we, need to be, we need to add a new layer uh, to, to, to an existing system, the system that works fairly well, uh, but that um, provides a lot of revenues to, to songwriters, composers, and publishers. This is not a, a, a business in decline. It's a growth business. Uh, it's uh, about $10 million, $10 million now. It uh, was uh, six, uh, ten years ago, so it's growing. Uh, but the Internet is, is presenting us with very difficult challenges, especially because the, the, the information is probably the same amount uh, to the power of three compared to the analog uses and the, and the money that is generated by this explosion of, of, of use of music is probably less than a tenth of a percent of what we would have in an analog world. So this, this, this is gap between the uh, unmanageable amount of information and the abysmal amount of money that we need, to, we need to address and we need to find efficient solutions for this, for this world. But there, 
they don't need to, to apply equally to the rest of the world. Some, some, some bits will be useful, some bits might be unnecessary. Well, you wanted to apply to Russia, let me tell you. I mean, I was recently in Moscow. Not only is their economy booming, but they want to build registries, and they want guidance, and they want to join a world copyright economy, but they do not want to follow. They want to lead in a new service-based approach as opposed to, say, focusing on products. That is a different world. It is more akin to music publishing. But it is key that we ensure that there are registries and some infrastructure such that there can be respect for rights. Because frankly, if we're not getting them systems and we're not training them in how to enter the information that can be then interoperable that we over the past decades have built and operate, then we are really going to be missing on something because China, Brazil, Russia, et cetera, these are places where we have a lot of work to do and we cannot be complacent and, and uh, about not, the task. We, we should not be arrogant, any, we shouldn't be arrogant either. Uh, Brazil is a good example of a, of a fairly sophisticated uh, ISWC, ISRC registration system yeah. and, and links between them. There are many things that are not working well in copyright in Brazil are not, are not optimal, but in this, in this respect, they are one of the most interesting examples, and we should look, we should look a bit closer. Talk about fragmentation. Do. I mean, how many yeah. PROs are yeah, there in th this is not, This is not great, but one, yeah. of the reason, what, that, what, one of the reasons why it's working a little bit, despite the, the regulatory environment that creates this fragmentation, is because they, they, they got together and they built, a, they built one tool to, to, to register uh, information and to link works and, uh, and uh, recording information in a sensible way. This is an example we should look at. Right. In, in, we in, should look in, at. And the Brazilians do a tremendous job of empowering people in the cultural community. You look at Gilberto Gil was the head of culture. I mean, they just they deliberately empower people. But I just say this briefly, which is that I have to disagree with you in the sense if you go to mandatory registration, not only do you have to re-examine the 76 Copyright Act, you'd have to re-examine burn because now you're, you're, you're putting in formalities. And I don't want to get visited by the ghost of Victor Hugo anytime <laughs> soon. But I, th but I do think there's a couple of things. One is that, you know, it's tough to have a conversation in a vacuum, and one of the things that you have to address is, is some sort of meaningful, meaningful orphan rights often works uh, stuff, because the, the orphan works thing will always come back to haunt you, because you can't figure out who this person is, and maybe they passed away without ears, and the orphan works have to be looked at in some way within this whole process, just to give people that sort of freedom to use stuff without worrying about infringing somebody's copyright that they can't find. That's a very yeah. interesting, um, Eric will know more about this than me, but that the orphan works thing is being dealt with very interestingly in mechanical licensing in Canada following a class action, where actually the, the settlement says the societies manage the money from orphan works, and there's, they have to put mechanisms in place so that the information is out there, as Fred said earlier on. And I think those sorts of mechanisms are, should be explored for other territories as well. But does it raise the issue that also one of the compelling aspects of this policy-wise is that it helps the licensees? I, I, wanted, I wanted to have Fred step in here for a second on this. Of course, but it's, it's, it's incumbent upon us. Uh, I, I licensed the, the World Repertoire in Canada. Uh, it's incumbent upon us to make it uh, fairly easily, easy for licensees or eager licensees to, to get a license from us. The, the, um, we, 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 we'll do whatever we, we can to, to help them understand the system, and one of the major hurdles they, they, they encounter is that they need to understand about uh, performing rights uh, for the... Uh, musical work and performing rights for the sound recording. So they need to understand the difference between performing rights and mechanical rights, the fact that there are various agencies dealing with all this. It's not optimal, so we're trying to find ways to, to, to act together, to, to approach the market in a more unified way. Um, but this having been said, one of, the, one of the things that we find it difficult is that many of those people um, would like us to uh, help them jumpstart their, their business. Uh, we, we, we sympathize, we, we want very successful new business models to, to, to bloom uh, here in Canada and all over the world, but like, I'm not sure they would get a discount from the uh, electricity company uh, or from uh, anyone else. Um, it's hard for us to, to give anyone a big break uh, just to help them get, get off, off, off the market. They have to make their calculations. They have to, they have to be realistic about the value of the, of, of, the, of the music, the rights we represent, and that's one of the difficulties we, 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 we find from time to time. We, we, we try to, to be very accommodating 
but at the end of the day, if they want to give us one and we, we think the value of the, of the rights we represent is 10, uh, they might think that we're a bit hard to deal with, but we're not. Eric, with music licensing in the United States, if it's discretionary licensing you're doing as an entrepreneur, and again, I think as an industry, we have to realize the customer is always right. We've got to figure out how to get their money. But we now present them with a proposition that is like a game of hearts. Either they get all the spades or the hearts and the queen of spades, or they shouldn't even try. And, because we punish them severely. And so we take an entrepreneurial service like turntable.fm. If it can be licensed through Sound Exchange, they're in business. And today, I understand they are paying Sound Exchange. But there are those who propose that turntable.fm's obligation is to find the licensee of every single piece of music that could be played on the service, lest they be held as an infringer. That would be crazy. Well, it, be crazy. It, yes, and yet that is the circumstance. Which if those who suggest <laughs> that they are not entitled to a sound exchange license are right, their obligation is to rights holders unenumerated and never met because you can upload a file. And who knows what's going to be on the file before it's uploaded. And so they are infringers unless they have a license from every single license holder and at $150,000 statutory damages, this is difficult. And so as an industry, we have to ask, how hospitable are we to those who would invest? And clearly, I mean, I have heard it from how many VCs, and I'm sure you have heard it too, that they do not want to invest into music ventures that have licensing ahead of them because the money will then be invested purely into attorneys who will work almost forever without ever reaching the conclusion of having enough licenses to allow the anarchistic use of music in a music service. And so this is a problem for us. And I am not suggesting that we can in any way coddle infringement, but if we want a sustainable economy of ideas, we will make it faster, easier, and simpler to pay in hopes that when it is, more people will, or we will watch the money continue to dwindle. No, it's the uh, CNE Perlman line, which is what is, the value, what is the value of a download? Anything greater than zero, you know? But like, my hat's off to right flow, by oh, the way, yeah. because at least in a product environment, they say, bring us your tired, your poor, your humble music needing to be licensed. We'll take care of it for 500 bucks, right? Maybe a little more. Yeah, but uh, you've raised the price. But <laughs> the point being that, I mean, you do say we will take care of it. We, and we do and try to take care of it. relatively flat fee. We, help, we, we think that, you know, promotes these companies going out and innovating and creating new economies of the future. But I think w one of the things that we all talked about, at all these international issues, every issue, the, the, the root of this problem starts in the studio. People leave these places, they make a recording, whether they're supported by a label or independent or not, or published or not, and they leave that place and they have no idea what to do. They don't know what an ISRC <coughs> is, they don't know what an ISWC is, and they don't care. And so I think one of the things we need to figure out is how to make sure people don't leave that studio without registering their works with the appropriate people. Right. That's the whole thing. Right. Um, maybe there should be a, a simple Pro Tools plug-in or a Logic plug-in, and, and they do, I'm serious. Well, and, they actually and, are building and, one, though, seriously. And, so no, and they, and they do not leave until that's done. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about is th these problems are huge. There's millions upon millions and millions of unclaimed works around the world. And I don't know how, in a world where we're constantly creating thousands and thousands of recordings a week as a group, as an industry, how we're ever going to catch up right. with, without empowering all of us to do all that work. You know, the internet's an amazing thing, and we all can go in and claim our own stuff if we just put it out there. One of the things that I, always, I was talk, alluding to before is why not make the unclaimed royalties transparent and allow people with some regulation, I'm not talking about claiming other people's stuff, allow to claim their works based upon the revenue. Put it out there. Let people see what's unclaimed. Let's, let's make it happen. But I don't think it's one organization or, or this that's going to do it. As Eric alluded to, the cost is tremendous. Well, I'd like to, well actually, Sound Exchange does that. Yeah, and the so, Canadian set. Yeah, you can well. go to but, the Sound Exchange website and claim repertoire that's mm -hmm. currently unclaimed. But I'm talking about all organizations. They're not one. I think it's a great start, but I think if we don't put it out there, no one group is going to solve the problem. What so, Mark so, just said is important to repeat. He pointed out that even the major labels have trouble paying for the work that they use. Right. As the Canadian settlement and the settlement in the United States prove, even the major labels, which are the biggest publishers and the biggest sound recording companies, owed hundreds of millions of dollars to the publishers and couldn't meet their obligation until there was a settlement. So it's not like you have to be an entrepreneur. You could be the most educated, most capitalized companies in our industry and still owe hundreds of millions of dollars because you cannot or did not find 
those to whom you owe the money. Or so this problem or, or, should be or apparent. Because you didn't, or because you didn't try very hard, and I don't want to, 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 be, uh, to, to, be, to be too uh, kind of uh, funny on this, uh, but this, is, this, this has become a, a big issue now, for exactly for the reasons pointed out by Mark. The music industry is shifting. The, the things that were not, that were important, uh, not important before, are beginning to be important. And some amounts of money that were uh, treated as uh, residual amounts, not important, are beginning to make sense to some players now. So people are paying attention. Uh, so it's 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 hard on on the one hand, but it's it's not that hard if you put your mind to it. And uh, what we would like to be able to see in the future is everybody in the industry, and that, that, that begins at the studio and that ends at the uh, DSPs or the broadcasters or the innovators, um, to, to everybody uh, focusing on getting it right and uh, and and making sure that the the integrity of the of the identifiers and the and the metadata is maintained through the through the the flows of uh, music from the source to the to the audience and yeah. that that needs the attention of uh, CEOs uh, of uh, uh, CEOs and technologists in the studios in the recording uh, companies and uh, broadcasters the internet portals etc etc it's an industry wide issue and just a little free plug we are we are trying to get uh, um, uh, some, some industry people at, uh, in February at uh, Transmission, something that happens in Victoria and British Columbia, on a metadata summit, because we need to get people's attention on this. And if it's just us, it won't work. Yeah. We need the CEO of the labels, we need the CEO of the studios to really recognize this as a priority policy, because the future of the business depends on it. But, but you know what? I mean, this isn't a major label problem. The major labels have it nailed. I mean, I, I come out of the major label system, and uh, their repertoire is well documented. It's got ISRCs, it's got ISWCs. I mean, they've, they've got it nailed. It's really the independent and performer community to whom this has got to become more of an issue. So, you know, building the awareness you alluded to earlier, and building some sort of, it, it's interesting, the, um, I'd like to pose the question, why, you know, the technology is easy actually, in building a repertoire database. It's not hard. I mean, there's actually people out there who, who have built them. Uh, what's hard, and what Mark has been working on, is the, is the exchange standards. I mean, ideally, we have these repertoire databases, but getting them to speak the same language, establishing the standards, uh, is really the hard part. And, you know, Mark, I, th I think, you, you know, you should speak to, this is actually, in the 10 years that I've been following it, since it was MI3P and now it's CDEX, is actually starting to happen. You have adoption at some of the uh, most important players for a standard, uh, which is an enabling uh, you know, technology to create this. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the level of implementation now is extremely high, and it is amongst the big companies, but it's not just the big companies. Um, a lot of small companies are implementing the, the exchange, the communication exchange standards, um, and you know there's a lot of rollout. Um, certainly, uh, some of the societies will not sign up new licensees unless they commit to report using the DDEX standards, and some of the labels are doing exactly the same thing. Um, we are now well past 600 implementation licenses. Um, so that's got to indicate that there are about 600 companies around the world implementing DDEX standards one way or the other. Yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, if you'd asked me that question 18 months ago, I wouldn't have been quite so bullish. Um, but I can be very bullish about it now, and I know beyond that, there's lots of stuff coming online, you know, this quarter, next quarter, and, and into two, 2012. And then, you know, you get to the point where it's ubiquitous, everybody's using it, and then the benefits really start to kick in. Um, and, and, and the thing to remember at the end, part of this, although it's what we're talking about is mainly B2B, we can't forget the poor old consumer who's actually not getting a terribly good deal with some of the metadata that they see in front of them. Um, and so at a B2B level, we need to sort it out, but the, the, the benefits, the, you, the, the additional benefit of it is the consumer gets a better experience, spends more money, increases revenue. So, you know, there's, there's a completely holistic issue here. I thought we might open it up. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, oh why don't you, right here. Do we have a microphone? Oh, cool. Excellent. He knows his stuff. Coming from you, that's quite a compliment. Um, 
You guys have surely witnessed what's happened with the Google uh, book uh, odyssey. And um, essentially, Google, by fiat, tried to create a equivalent of a rights database for book content and was told by a federal judge, ah, ah, you can't do that, at least not on the basis that they were looking to do it. So I'm, I'd like to ask everybody, but especially Jim and Mark, what, what takeaways you've gotten, what lessons you think may apply from the Google Book experience to the WIPO and the GRD projects? Um, if any. No, no, well, I think, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, in a way, I've, I hope I've covered it, that you know, the project that GRD is now doing, um, the biggest tranche of work is around stakeholder engagement. You have to engage as wide a group of the community as you possibly can. The Google Book settlement didn't do that. It was one company versus the American Association of Publishers, and the, the, the authors got a bit of a look in in the, in the debate. But, so it was... Actually, I, I have to disagree with you. Um, if you want stakeholder engagement, a lawsuit is a great way to get it. I, I agree in the, in the sense, but it wasn't, there wasn't a, a, a level of engagement across the whole industry that people could feel that they've got some skin in the game. Um, and that's really the issue that we're addressing, that, that, that um, Jim's addressing through IMR, is trying to engage the whole community so that people feel they're part of the discussion, they're part of the development. Yeah, well, it, well, this gets it, back it, to what Fred was it, saying it, re it regarding... It didn't, it didn't sorry. At the end of the day, it didn't work uh, because there was not any, any sufficient buy-in from the rice holders. Uh, if there That's is one, not if, why if, it didn't if work. There, if, there, if, there, if there was one company that has the kind of firepower that Fred was alluding to, it's Google. They can bring any IT resource to any problem well, they want. The, but I mean, you need to have the cooperation of rice holders because they own the property, they own the rights, and nobody can expropriate them from the way they want to manage their rights without their say-so. But, but Google let's remember, that. Let's remember that there was a settlement um, by, the, by the publishers and by the authors. They collaboratively came up with the idea of the registry. At the end of the day, they had a plan, and it was a unilateral plan sort of forced by one company which gets back to Fred's comment about, you know, should this be a private sector thing and the rest of the world falls along? Well, what happened was, yes, there was an accommodation, but the judge said, ah, 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 can't do that. The because, judge said it's a matter of copyright, you, have, you can't really have to opt out. You have to opt in. You can't, you can't tell people well, that your, your, you, right. can't te you can't tell people that your rights will be managed that, that way and you have no choice. That's what Google said. They said, you're, right. you're in unless you disagree. And uh, the, the, the copyright system is the opposite, it, and, it, and it doesn't work that, that badly. The three million authors, composers, and publishers in the, in the society's network are all, have all opted in. There's no one that compels them to be a member of ASCAP, PRS, uh, SOCAN, or SASM. It's a choice. They can, opt, they, they can decide to manage that on their own, but they've seen the business sense that uh, it makes to pool the, the repertoires. And Google ignored that. That's one of the things I, I told them at the time because they happened to, have, to ask me, and they, they, they ignored it. They thought they could really push this through, ignoring the basic part of the copyright legislation around the world. It's an opt-in system. Opt-out, it's, it's illegal. On behalf of the IMR, I would say, you know, what are the learnings from the Google Book settlement? I, I guess, first of all, rights holders don't trust Google. That, that's one of the first learnings, is that people have a difficulty trusting someone when they provide a service where you could just sit down and type in the name of an artist, and then it adds free MP3 to the end of it, and, you know, there you go. It's as effective as Napster at connecting people with the stuff they want. So rights holders, they have a problem with that. You know, on a fundamental gut level of trust, they have trouble there. And so... There is a problem. I think secondly, I think what you learn is don't try to create one. In fact, try to ensure that there are many and that you are merely trying to synchronize, you know? We don't think that about email. Everybody has their own email system, but we synchronize their operation. Look at the domain naming system. 
We don't try to create one. We allow registrars all around the world to do that work, but they do synchronize together into one accessible DNS system that can respond within single-digit milliseconds to any request of it. So I think not trying to create one Uber registry, but instead acknowledging that everybody can and will create many registries and ensuring that that happens, and then seeking only to tie them together uh, such that there could be an internationalized access. I think that's another difference. Another learning is, is that you should move forward without everybody on board only at your own peril. It's an enormous risk to move forward without the Chinese. If you think that, for example, they will get on the plane somewhere, that you can take the plane off and expect them to be on board when it lands, you're mistaken, of course. It is important that there be great respect paid to China and to other large countries like Russia, et cetera. And so if you have them on board before the plane takes off, they are more likely to be there when it lands and therefore part of an international system. And so I think that is another learning. And of course, finally, looking at it from the American perspective that say Congress is the only one that can create copyright right. law really doesn't apply when you're putting together an international registry that synchronizes many things. So I think you're right. There's a lot to learn there. And there's probably more things that I haven't covered. Uh, but watched it very, very carefully, don't intend to repeat those mistakes. And uh, I do wonder sometimes, it, what if it had been a more neutral company that had sought to do this and had done it as a, a coalition and so forth? Yeah. Perhaps it might have had more progress. Well, um, the Open yeah. Right. yeah, and I don't know, maybe it could have been better or not, but it is just fair to say that uh, you know, the role of WIPO in, say, putting together, though there are differences between patents, uh, and trademarks, but to take that lead and say there is great value in the world being able to peruse the many mouse traps that have been created and failed, or you know the great work that is out there, that there is great value in the enumeration of rights, and that that is a basic standard for respect of property rights, is that you who claim them ought to enumerate them and participate right. in a system that makes that efficient and right. happens it's and that it's available to everyone. But the, That's important. And the, and the orphan works part was a little problematic as well. But I, I think, I think you had a question, sir, right there? No, no, I think it was this gentleman right here. Oh, okay. Thank you. There uh, is respect paid to John Simpson, who created yeah. Sound Exchange, the uh, engine of prosperity. Um, thank you. A couple of things that, that I just can't leave without comment. First, Jim, you know, I love your examples, but the captain of the fishing ship, he doesn't have to tell you who the fisherman was, whether there were co-fishermen, who owns the boat, whether the rights of the boat are split between territories, who the cook was. That's the problem we have. If it was just as easy as who's making the sashimi, I'd be treating tonight, okay? Agreed. Um, so let's maybe leave the fishing boat but behind. But communication adds value. And, That's the point. And Jonathan, with respect to the major labels, they may be great on their top line product, but when you get into catalog, they have no idea how to find the artists who they used to pay 30 years ago or 40 years ago. They have no idea how to pay them now for the are, most Are you part. talking as John Simpson, the performer, right now? I am. I am. <laughs> Universal owns my masters, and I'm trying to get them back. And, Open you know, for Jethro Tull. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the records no, but, are rarities. But seriously, I mean, we had many issues. Labels didn't know what they owned. Um, right. What's it? Oh, well, obviously the sidemen and, and who right. the non-featured are. I mean, they're very good on what they own, especially the top-line stuff that's generating 80% of the money right now. When you get into the deep catalog, you know, I, I wouldn't go there. It's as bad as the independent labels, which, which is difficult. Some indies are fabulous and are really on top of their data and are terrific at fixing their data. Others, obviously, as you know, took the UK $2 million to fix data that had been supplied to them and was required to be provided. So it's a mixed bag out there. Agreed oh, with you. And by the way, I think the Dewey Decimal System sold a lot of books. I agree. You know, it's just that I, I totally communication and enumeration leads to commerce, and that uh, obscurity and keeping your light under a bushel is not a good strategy for monetization. Uh, I would have yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm with you, though. Fish are different than uh, this, this songs. Is, this, is a great, this is a great point. Yeah. We, we, should, we, shouldn't, we should not delude ourselves. The problems are still out there, and uh, the, the top line products and pro top line uh, works are not the issue. They're well covered. Right. What, what is problematic is everything else. That's what is expensive, and that's what we can't ignore anymore. So it, that's, that's why I think that we need to get the top people's attention still. They, if they believe that the problem is solved, my God, the problem is worse than I thought.
I think we had one more. Do we have this gentleman here? Um, yeah, I'm wondering about uh, the back to the metadata. I think there's no question that it's really important that we get some sort of standard and unified database, both for creators and, and rights holders. But my question is, is what motivates the major labels to cooperate with this venture? Because it, you know, transparency means they're going to have to actually pay people. And and John's uh, John's uh, gave me a nice setup there because yes, the you know the very top sellers are are most often taken care of, but there's so many records in the catalog, so many musicians who have not been put into the system. What motivate what what motivates the labels to comply, and what pressure can be applied to make them comply? Uh, to me, there's a very simple answer to that. If they don't do this, they won't get their money let alone whether or not they can identify who they've got to pay on to afterwards. That's a fundamental problem that they've got, that if they don't have their metadata in order, they won't be able to match it against usage and therefore they won't get paid. It's the same for everybody in the supply chain. Some it's worse than for others, um, but that, that's fundamentally the problem we've all got, is if we don't <coughs> enumerate what, we're, what we own, um, we won't get paid. I, I think that's a great way to end. I'm being told we have to end. Uh, thanks again for coming. I want to thank George Tom for naming the building after me, but more importantly, um, I think I can speak for everyone that we're very encouraged that everyone took such an active interest in this, and I think it's a very important issue, but I, I just think actually looking into the crowd while we were talking, I saw the interest people had. That was extremely, extremely encouraging. So I'd like to thank our panelists, and thank you for attending the panel. Thank you. That's good.